Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to HydroTerra's latest webinar. It's a fantastic audience. We've got uh, over 450 registrants today, so obviously a topic of significant interest. The topic today is environmental monitoring requirements, a changing game, understanding your GED and compliance obligations, a legal and operational perspective. We're lucky to have a really impressive panel here today. We've got Andrew Swan and Alan Cummins, who are principals from Circular Resources Australia. They are a consultancy that sort of specialise in providing operational advice in this area. And we've got Jacqueline Plant, who's a partner with Norton Rose Fulbright, and she's very experienced with providing legal advice in this area. And you've got myself, who's very experienced with environmental management and monitoring generally. Before we start, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Here's a picture of all our presenters. They will be, we will be breaking it into two sections. Jackie will be going first, and then Andrew and Alan will be following up with the more operational side of things. And then I will be talking briefly about the execution of the monitoring. A little bit about our presenters. So Jacqueline Plant is a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright and has over 15 years experience as an environment and planning lawyer. Jackie is highly sought after for her expertise in advising on all aspects of the new environmental and circular economy legislative regime in Victoria, including assisting clients to obtain environmental approvals, advising on pollution events and incident report response, advising on the new positive general environmental duty, contaminated land and waste duties and providing representation in relation to regulatory action taken by the environmental regulator for private and public clients in the waste resource recovery, water, commercial and industrial sectors. It all sounds very impressive. Other important facts about Jackie is she's an Adelaide girl and studied law in Adelaide University. She's passionate about geography, which led her to focus more on environmental law. And she has a love of playing with words, which is why she took up law in the first place. So thanks, Jackie, very much for presenting today. Now, CRA. So these are the operational consultants, was founded by Andrew Swan and Alan Cummins in 2019 to provide high-level strategic environmental compliance and operational support to industry associations and state and local government organisations around the environmental compliance aspects of their activities. Both Andrew and Alan have extensive hands-on management experience operating EPA licensed businesses in the environmental services space, including the highly regulated hazardous waste management sector. Their real life practical knowledge and experience in understanding environmental compliance matters helps them deliver practical and sustainable solutions. So a little bit on their personal details. So, so Andrew Swan originally studied science at Monash University and did honours in stem cell research. Uh, Commercialised he, he was received a commendation for bravery for disarming a uh, person at Monash University who was wielding a gun. So congratulations for that. And has been in the waste industry for more than 15 years. Alan Cummins, well, he started his career in professional photography and then moved into the waste industry. He's worked for many years in the waste industry, starting with JJ Richards and uh, 
working for a range of companies, including Suez. Um, myself, I've got a background in environmental consulting and hydrogeology. I worked as an EPA auditor for a while. And um, I think between us, we provide a pretty good perspective on the challenges that the GED is uh, bringing to the industry and the opportunities as well. Before we charge into things, we love your questions. And I would uh, appreciate it if you can ask lots of questions today. We will read them out at the end of the presentation. To lodge a question, you need to use the Q&A button at the top of your screen. You type your question in there and I will read it out to the presenters and we will do our best to answer them. If we run out of time, which we sometimes do, um, we will send you a written response to your question. Why does Hydroterra do these webinars? Well, it's actually very enjoyable. We get to meet a lot of people, um, but primarily we like to share knowledge, facilitate education, and we like to take a leadership position in the industry. This topic today is one that uh, I'm really proud of us presenting on because we deal a lot with the industry and I'm seeing a bit of uh, friction in the industry at the moment with the application of you know, the new act and the GED and a bit of confusion in the market for how consultants are meant to be advising operators and operators unsure of exactly what their obligations are, all of which is obviously very logical when you introduce new legislation, but it's great to have some experienced practitioners, both from a legal and operational background mm -hmm. to help us get clarity of what's required. So without further ado, I will pass to Jackie to present. Sounds terrific to be here with you all this afternoon and uh, looking forward to the presentations from the others. Um, Richard, I might just ask you to click to the first slide. Um, so uh, for some of you, um, this might be uh, new territory or, um, or not as familiar with the um, environment protection regime in Victoria. So um, for some, it might be a a recap and others that might be a new experience. So um, I hope you all find um, something to take away from um, my uh, aspect of the presentation. And um, so just to, I, I, I'm going first to set the scene about um, the Environment Protection Act and the legal framework that has been set up by the Act that's now been in operation for coming up to three years. So it's an, an interesting point in time to reflect on um, the, the developments that have happened and the interpretation that we're starting to see in a practical sense now that we've had this um, new legislation. Uh, Jackie, are you there? We previously had a system that was very much reactionary and based on responding to pollution um, and harm. We now have an act where at the, the centre of it is a... general environmental duty and it's a very broad um, duty in that it applies to not only individuals but companies and anybody that has capacity. It um, it applies in uh, a very large range of situations so where someone is engaging in an activity that may give rise to the risk of harm to human health on the, or the environment from pollution or waste. And the, the requirement is that you need to minimise the risks of harm to human health or the environment so far as is reasonably practicable. 
And you'll see on the slide, I've got those words so far as reasonably practical bolded um, because that is, um, that's a concept that's really important in the duty and puts a bit of a limitation on it. And I'll come to that next in terms of explaining what that means. Um, but one, I think, really important point to bear in mind about the GED is that um, unlike other jurisdictions in Australia that have a similar duty, the Victorian duty is backed up by um, criminal and civil penalties. So that means that if you don't comply with the GED, that um, it, there's the ability for the EPA to prosecute or commence civil, um, civil penalty proceedings and um, impose fines. And I've got on the slide there what the maximum penalties are. So for a company where we're verging on a maximum penalty of $1.9 million. So certainly, um, you know, a very significant um, deterrent in those maximum penalties. Um, interestingly, one one point about the GED that is important, I think, to bear in mind when I was talking about this um, being a proactive and risk-based and prevention framework is that a breach of the general environmental duty doesn't necessarily require there to be harm that's actually caused. It is um, if you fail to have the preventative measures in place um, that would amount, that can amount to a breach. Um, so we we, are, we still um, enforce um, issues where there are pollution and there are still provisions that deal with that, but um, the GED uh, uh, doesn't require there to be actual harm caused before, um, before there is a breach that occurs. Richard, could you go to the next slide? Thanks. So um, in terms of what the GED will actually require someone to do, um, I think here we've got um, the five bullet points and Andrew and Alan will um, bring these alive somewhat when they um, come to their section of the talk. But um, I think it's important for you to understand that what it requires is effectively um, the use and maintain, uh, maintaining of um, adequate systems, basically to ensure that you are minimising risk and that you are identifying, assessing and controlling those risks and that you do have appropriate those appropriate systems in place so that if a risk does eventuate, you, you have um, some control measures to make sure that any effects um, can be minimised. And then there are these requirements to make sure that when you're handling substances or storing them, transporting them, that you are, again, minimising the risks associated with doing those activities. And then the last point there is about... Um, it's important or you, you must provide information, instruction, supervision and training to staff. So ensuring where you are an organisation that's conducting um, you know, an activity or a business that that all of the people who are, who are involved in the activity right, right through from management, right through to the people on the ground, have the relevant knowledge and expertise to understand what the risks are and that they are, um, you know, they're all playing their part in making sure that they understand um, what the legal obligation is. Next slide. Thanks, Richard. Okay, so coming back to this concept of um, reasonable practicability, which um, is a component that um, features in a number of the duties in the Environment Protection Act, including the general environmental duty that I just mentioned. Um, so where those duties, including the GED, require there to be minimisation of risk of harm to human health and the environment, what the Act requires is for there to be um, elimination of risks, um, if that's possible, but where that's not reasonably practicable, that you take steps to minimise um, risks uh, of, of harm. And in order to, um, I guess, determine what is reasonably practicable in minimising risks, we've got those um, five factors there, um, which you need to have regard to in determining what is what it is that you can do in terms of identification, assessment, um, and then implementation of measures to, to minimise risk. So you need to look at what's the likelihood um, of a risk occurring, what's the degree of harm that could be caused, what the duty holder knows or ought to know about um, a particular risk, what are the measures that are available to control the risks, and then lastly um, is cost uh, looking at cost in proportion to the risk. So balancing out what is the, um, the risk 
that is posed and how much might it cost to take measures to implement um, certain controls. So and effectively, this reasonable practicability operates like a bit of a limitation. So it, the duty is not necessarily requiring you to do all things and in all circumstances, there needs to be a degree of proportionality about what your response is. Um, so in understanding what it is that you um, need to do to um, comply Jackie, we can't hear you at the moment. ...that you um, know or you ought to know um, in that objective and subjective sense about um, managing the risks that are posed by your activity. Um, so where you get the state of knowledge from comes from a number of different sources. So um, there are... Um, things that come from the EPA, so guidance and anyone that's um, been practising in the area or has had to um, look at this will be aware that the EPA, since the Act has come in, has released a whole number of guidelines that um, provide specific, you know, that are specific to industries and activities. Um, knowledge also comes from industry as well and what is considered best practice in terms of um, ways of conducting activities and procedures. Um, it also comes from the government um, or things like, you know, the Australian standards, um, as well as, you know, practice that's that's undertaken by business and engineers. So it's a it's a fluid concept. So um, it it evolves over time and the expectation about um, knowledge is evolving as the the framework and and the duty um, matures with the passage of time. So essentially, you know, the expectation for um, duty holders will increase as as the state of knowledge matures and it, it increases. Can we move on now, Richard, to our next slide? And um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, the permissioning framework that we have in Victoria. So the permissioning framework is, um, you know, a key part of the, the Environment Protection Act. And effectively, we now have a system where there are three tiers of permissions. Um, so previously we had um, we had these uh, the terms of works approvals and licenses, and those have now been replaced um, with different types of licenses, permissions and registrations. And effectively, you'll see with this pyramid diagram that they go in kind of a tiered approach based upon the level of risk that's posed by um, the activity that's being regulated. So the idea of a permission is effectively to put some levels of control around a particular activity and um, uh, and make sure that there's a degree of oversight. And the degree of oversight will obviously depend on the level of risk that's posed by the activity so all of the different activities that require some kind of permission are set out in the Environment Protection Regulations. So for those that like the detail, that's Schedule One of the regulations. Um, and you know some of the you know some of the sorts of activities that you'll find if you do a bit of a dive into those regulations are um, landfills, um, waste treatment facilities. Um, all kinds of primary production like piggeries and um, cattle feed lots, um, all of the chemical production activities, um, extractive industries and utilities. So the permissioning framework covers a lot of activities that um, are conducted um, where there are certain levels of risk that are posed by activities. Um, and it's an, I think it's important to understand that where you have a permission, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't also comply with the general environmental duty. The permissioning framework, as I've got on the slide there, works alongside of the GED, um, I, I guess in terms of ensuring the, the, that we've got some performance standards and that they're met across activities. Um, certainly conditions will help people comply with their GED, but um, it's, not, it's, I guess, it's not, I guess, a sufficient way to operate to think that if you solely comply with your license conditions, that that means that you don't need to do anything else in terms of the GED. So 
I'm sure Andrew and Alan can will bring that to life um, somewhat more. Um, but I thought, you know, just really important to bear that in mind that um, license compliance doesn't always equal GED compliance. Thanks, Richard. Um, so a little bit more about how license, the permissioning framework and licenses um, uh, bring in our compliance and monitoring requirements. So really um, a lot of the limitations on activities um, uh, come from having conditions imposed on those permissions. So as I've said there on the slide that conditions really set a minimum standard of performance under the general environmental duty. And as I said, in placing um, certain levels of restrictions or on certain activities and actions, and they um, will specify certain environmental outcomes that a particular activity will need to meet. So some conditions will be applied generally across a particular permissioning type. So if we use, again, the example of a landfill, there are certain conditions that are standard for all landfill licences um, to regulate that, um, that type of, the, the types of um, impacts or activities that are occurring within a landfill operation. Um, but also there's the ability for the EPA to develop um, or impose specific conditions that might apply to complex or sites or complex activities. So it's not always a one size fits all in terms of conditions. Um, there is also, um, I guess, um, a, an important point to make is that conditions don't always address all of the, the common risks that might occur where there's already um, a level of knowledge about a particular activity in industry. Um, so, but, 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 it, but also, I guess, on the flip side of that, there are conditions that can often require a common performance standard in industry. Um, there are often requirements, and Andrew and Ellen might come to this, in terms of um, bringing in the monitoring requirements to... Jackie. There'll be a requirement. I think you need to speak again there, Richard. It, uh, it seems to be when you uh, make a comment, the internet listens. Yeah. <laughs> Jackie, there we, we, um, we, we lose you, have lost you sporadically during it, the present. Oh. Which, um, um, I'll, keep, sure I'll keep pressing on um, and hopefully the connection stabilises itself. All right. Thanks. But you might want to just um, reiterate around conditions, features. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so conditions, features, um, as I was saying, they, they can be common across a permission type or a, a class of activity. So as I was, I was um, saying, we might have, if we take the example of a look, We've lost you again, Jackie. Um, I'll keep going. And uh, so landfills will have conditions that are often standard across all landfills in terms of the types of activities that they um, operate because there are significant risks that they pose and that um, need to be standardised across industry. But also there's the flexibility in the conditions uh, in the EPA's conditions powers to impose conditions that are uh, specific to a site or um, specific to an activity uh, where those a particular site or a particular activity has a risk that's not necessary. Of restrictions on a common activity. Um, so if the state of knowledge is well developed um, and uh, we, we, we don't necessarily need a condition to, to regulate those things, um, 
there won't necessarily be one, but where there is a requirement to have, a, I guess, a common performance standard across industry for specific risks, then um, we will um, often see conditions. I'm not sure if you heard the point I was making about um, reporting um, on compliance with permissions. Richard, give me a nod yeah. if we heard that bit. I think you better go over it again. Okay. So um, conditions will often require some sort of management, uh, sorry, admin, uh, well, management or administrative um, actions to be taken, like reporting back to the EPA on compliance with um, a condition of a permission or providing data on certain emissions that might be generated in an activity. And that's a way of EPA um, having the duty holders inform them um, and provide information about um, compliance. So really there's a, you know, there's very much a, a positive expectation that permission holders um, understand what their obligations are, what their risks are, and have appropriate controls in place so that they are compliant with their operations and their um, their permissions. Um, and I'll come to talk a little bit about compliance in a moment, but we need to obviously make sure that, um, that we're aware that non-compliances with conditions and the general environmental duty can be enforced by the EPA through a range of different tools. So they have a lot of different tools in their toolbox um, in terms of being able to issue remedial notices. In the case of um, permissions, they can suspend licenses or revoke them for a certain amount of time until a site is compliant. And as I also mentioned um, with the GED, there are civil and criminal um, proceedings that can be brought for failure to comply with the GED or, or also license conditions. So um, the EPA is not, um, you know, ha has has been ramping up its compliance efforts. And I'll um, I'll take you through a little a, a few um, statistics in a moment. Um, but really just to make people aware of what the EPA's regulatory approach is. Um, it, it really aims to um, use a mix of both Jackie, are you there? They they use the EPA uses a range of um, a risk based approach. Um, based on science and also um, uh, also making sure that they devote their efforts to the most significant risks. Um, the job of the EPA is also to set standards, so um, really to be there to enforce or to, to have a basis for what the community expects um, and what is industry best practice. Um, and those standards will evolve over time, but they come from... Um, the legislation, which I've, which I've talked about, um, as well as the interpretation of that legislation through court decisions um, and certain rulings and determination, and also through the environmental reference standards. So um, those are standards that define the environmental values that we have um, and include things like water, land, um, air, and um, they are kind of the benchmarks that we are aiming for protection against. Um, and then also we have the, um, the permissions, of us, as I talked about, um, need to ensure that we have some level of performance standards. The EPA, as I said, also is very um, keen on making sure that compliance is monitored appropriately. And as I said, um, duty holders play a pretty significant role in um, helping the EPA with monitoring by doing monitoring themselves. It's not always about the EPA coming out to monitor to check for compliance. Um, they obviously do that and they have a, a whole enforcement team that, that does that. Um, but it is, um, you know, it is a big part of, um, of making sure that um, compliance is achieved is, is through the duty holders' obligations. Um, if we could just go to the next slide there, please, Richard. Sure. Yeah. Um, just uh, thought I would um, finish out my section by just giving you a little bit of background on 
um, what we're seeing in the compliance space um, from the EPA in most recent times. So um, in the last year that um, the EPA's reported on, they've issued that um, more than 1,200 notices um, to direct action to be taken. So there are, as I mentioned, there are a whole range of different types of notices that the EPA can issue in terms of um, improvement notices or environmental action notices that require duty holders to take steps often to bring um, a site into compliance where they're not complying with licence conditions. Um, and you know, the EPA is also exercising its criminal powers and we've seen the first charges laid for um, the bre a breach of the general environmental duty. Um, so I think you know my observations as someone working in working in the industry and and seeing a number of clients that are interfacing with the, the EPA that um, you know there was certainly, a lighter touch from the EPA in the first um, year or two in terms of um, making sure people who weren't as familiar with the the EPA and its role and the new regime um, to to give them, I guess, a little bit of a grace period, if you like, not and not um, using the full force of the law um, in those early periods. But I think um, the the next couple of slides, uh, Richard, if we could go to one of those really highlights that the EPA is ramping up its more formal um, enforcement action. So in the last year, we've seen almost a doubling of the number of prosecutions that have been commenced um, and a lot of official warnings being issued. And then also I've highlighted there that the number of infringement notices is, um, has gone back up again, which I think is you know kind of consistent with the first couple of years being about um, you know, an educational piece for for duty holders, but um, certainly, you know, my anecdotal experience is that um, compliance is, you know, is 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 very, you know, very much important for the EPA as a priority and making sure that duty holders remain accountable, and you know, they are expecting more in terms of um, sophistication and knowledge, and um, you know, where that's not being demonstrated, that they're, they're not afraid to to use their enforcement powers. So um, I think, um, you know, we, we're, we're expecting to, to see that trend continue in terms of, um, you know, making sure that the duty holders um, are held to account. And um, yes, so we've, we've got here a, a couple of more statistics around um, directions and environmental action notices and improvement notices, you'll see those numbers are, are reasonably high in comparison to the, the last couple of years. So my, yeah, my inclination is that we'll continue to see um, the use of notices and, and prosecutions. Um, we've, we've, um, our firm's acted for a number of clients who've um, been the subject of those sorts of enforcement actions um, and, and license Failure to comply with license conditions is is one of the the key areas where prosecutions are often commenced. Um, for yeah, where you know where the EPA detects that you, you don't have adequate um, systems in place to deal with um, you know things like uh, equipment failures or spills, um, or that you know monitoring hasn't been done on an appropriate level. So, I guess I'm giving you the, um, the a bit of an um, a foray into what can come when monitoring and compliance doesn't go well and doesn't go right. Um, so hopefully you won't be seeing me if you do the things that um, Alan and Andrew are going to tell you how to do well and um, do them well and you'll hopefully avoid needing to um, to deal with me or to deal with the EPA. So on that note, I'll, um, I will pass the baton over to Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Just made it in there. <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, so here's a little quote that we like to put forward. It um, reiterates what Jacqueline said around the GED is that it's not that you get caught doing something wrong, it's the risk that could go wrong. So it's more about managing, um, you know, proper compliance throughout rather than, you know, um, oops, something's already happened. So next slide, please, Richard. So um, the GED um, 
hugely important in Victoria. So, you know, the five parts, it's so important. We've put a little copy in the corner as well. So you can just keep a, a record of whether it's risk, maintenance, system, storage, handling, and training. So they're the five. Um, and that's basically, I mean, they're all pretty self-explanatory. We'll go through them um, now. So Alan, I'll um, let you. Right. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, and thanks, Jackie. I thought that was really, um, really informative and gave us a really good overview of, of the legal requirements behind it. Um, we're going to touch on risk first, because essentially um, understanding your risk is the key component of complying. So that's where all, all of your monitoring programs uh, should really uh, start from. Um, it's really important that you get this part right. Um, you know, it's a key component of the GED. Um, some businesses are going to have more inherent risk than other businesses. For example, if you're in a retail store or a cafe, you're going to have a lot less risk than, for example, a, um, a liquid treatment facility that deals with hazardous waste. As such, um, this is reflected in the EPA permissions and the requirement for what you're going to need to satisfy. Uh, so we'll discuss that sort of further in the presentation. We'll give you some examples of that. Um, but there's an expectation that the higher the risk of the operation that you're doing, the, the higher state of knowledge and the better management of your risks that you will have. Now, these documents here, EPA have uh, developed some excellent doc documents here. Um, let me just get those numbers of them again. So... Uh, Assessing and Controlling Risk, a Guide for Business. That's um, EPA Publication 1695. Um, if you haven't downloaded that, it's a great idea to, uh, to do that because it steps you through the process for how to do a risk assessment if you're not familiar with the process. Um, we use that. We do a lot of risk assessments for a wide range of customers and we use this as a standard for, for ours. You know, it's great to use a, a simple system that's understood by everyone, because as we'll get to later, your staff need to understand this sort of thing as well. If, they, uh, if they're not aware of the risks and the controls, you're not going to the extent you should be to manage those risks. Uh, the, other doc the other document on the other side there, liquid storage and handling guidelines. That's really important. A lot of our customers liquid uh, handle liquids, uh, being hazardous wastes and whatnot. Um, it, that walks through how to, to safely store those those documents. That's EPA publication 1698. So if we could have the next slide, please, Richard. Um, so this is a typical uh, risk assessment structure. Um, this is taken from the EPA guidelines. Uh, as mentioned before, it's, it's good to have um, a simple system. This is well accepted. There are other ways you can do it. You don't have to do it this way, but... If you do, you know, it's the more people that do it in a simple way, the easier it is to understand. Um, it is a great idea when doing your risk assessments to have a third party look at it for you. Um, because when you're in the weeds in the business, it's sometimes difficult to step back and, and identify risks that you see every day. And you might just manage them off the top of your head, knowing having that experience, but um, having someone in there to identify it especially when um, if you've got new staff and that sort of thing, you want them to have um, be able to understand and see these risks as well so they don't make the mistakes that you might not identify. Um, according to this matrix, if we look at the, the one on the top left there, um, it's a basically a, a likelihood versus consequence assessment. Um, you go through and identify the, the hazard, um, what the impact can be, um, do the assessment, you do a pre-controls assessment and a post-controlled assessment. Now, um, once you put your controls into place, you're, um, you're looking basically to either eliminate them if you can, substitute, engineer the control out, develop administrative controls, and at the very least have PPE. That's your last, last line of defence, really. If it gets to that stage, something bad's probably happened. Um, if we look at the, um, at the at the ratings on these, basically anything high and above is an unacceptable level of risk. 
medium and medium high can be acceptable, but you really want to reduce your risk. And that goes with the GED. You're always trying to reduce your risks. Uh, you know, no one wants anything like that to happen. So that's um, that's a brief summary of um, assessing and controlling risk, but a key component and a really good basis to start your, your compliance journey from. We could... Oh. Alan, just a question. So in terms of meeting your GED, if you haven't done a, a risk assessment, does that mean you can't meet your GED? Is it sort of a mandatory step? Yes, yes and no, um, but most likely yes. It'll depend on the type of uh, activity you're you're doing. So if you've got a if you're a retail business, for example, they're not going to expect you to have a risk assessment when all you do is put your cardboard boxes into a cardboard bin um, in a shopping centre. Um, if you're managing a, a, a liquid waste facility, the the expectation on you is to have that heavily documented because the risks are very high. So in terms of this assessment of very low upwards, like that's obviously a little bit subjective. Um, if the EPA feels differently to what you've done there, um, what what's the process on them, I guess, checking the adequacy of a risk assessment? Do they have oversight of it or it's just like when something goes wrong, it gets pulled out? It, it gets pulled out if something goes wrong or it gets pulled out when they come to check your site. So if they arrive on your site, one of the things they're probably going to ask for is to see your, your risk assessment. And they're going to, they have of enough skill and ability to be able to look at a risk assessment and go, hang on, you're, you're handling, um, you know, cyanide, for example, that's, that's high risk, but you've got it as a very low risk. You know, and and you can read through a risk assessment and see if someone's actually monitored these correctly or just given themselves low risk. Yeah, it must be a, a certain point of um, potential conflict though between the EPA and the operator, just yeah. given the and subjectivity yeah. of it all. <laughs> yeah, and look, at, and it is subjective to a degree. Uh, that's why it's a good idea to have a third party look at it to, you know, provide a... a, a Okay. It's a knowledge base to 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 make those calls on as well. Yeah. And and you'll see with those big with the big companies like your cleaner ways and that sort of thing, they will have they have environmental teams that can do that. So they're independent to that that business unit, for example. So they have those people come in, they're employed by cleaner ways. So it's not completely independent, but they're they're not on that site every single day doing that. Uh, like getting getting used to those risks, I guess. Yeah. Shall I go to the next slide? Yes, please. Yep. So if we look at um, how we would um, work on managing your risks and getting a satisfying your GED, um, you need a good environmental management system. Now, this diagram here sort of outlines a... a, a a typical um, EMS um, for, for the likes of a compost site, for example, where you've got a stockpile management plan, but not necessarily only compost, but anywhere that stores combustible, recyclable waste materials, um, you know, you should have each of these sort of um, items in there. Um, a good EMS is critical to proving um, not only what you're going to do, but also provide a firm training uh, platform for your staff. So if you've got all of this sort of thing documented, it you're able to teach your staff new and existing um, and demonstrate that you've shown them how to do the right thing. So for example, an environmental management plan, um, this is an older diagram, but you know it's probably more likely gonna be called an environmental risk monitoring and management plan now. Um, that's gonna, um, that's going to set out how you're going to manage those risks, how often you're going to check them. Um, this it's like your um, it's the best word. It's 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 like your bible for how you're going to your instruction manual for how you're going to do it. And the EPA will ask to see that type of document when they attend site. Thanks, Alice. So, 
Um, here we have, uh, well, when is monitoring required? Um, so there's a few elements to it. Usually when we talk about EPA permissions, we're talking about um, waste, you know, predominantly the EPA regulates waste facilities. So for those types of businesses, you need to be able to know what waste is coming in, how much, how much can you store? And when you process it, where is it going? Is that a lawful place? How much? And then, you know, have a bit of an idea as to the mass balance of, of these wastes coming in and out. And then more importantly for Richard, um, it's more around discharge to environment. So when do you release water to the environment? In what form? You know, how do you release air um, to the environment, whether it's from a combustion engine or some type of odour scrubber, um, noise, and, and these types of things are where you can monitor your um, environmental performance. And this is, you know, this is an important part of the GE day as well. So typically around waste, acceptance in and out, and then also, what are we releasing to the environment and, and how do we know that we're not causing harm to human health or the environment? Next slide, please. Just before we do, so yes. monitoring to meet your GED requirement versus your licence requirement, there can be a big gap there, is there? Uh, typically, yeah, there can be. I mean, uh, a, a licence usually won't, emphasize that you're not allowed to have dust leave the site you know but that's something that the GED would cover um, unless it's a specific condition say an extractive license might have dust monitoring um, for a normal transfer station like your local Burundara transfer station um, that's not going to be part of their permission to operate you know so that's when you get those specific conditions that are, are applicable and bespoke to the operational that's being licensed. So who decides if, the, if there's enough monitoring going on? Well, I can tell you, Richard, you're in a great pot, the spot, because <laughs> it's always going to get more. Um, you know, things are getting more complicated, more intertwined. The EPA is a science-driven, data-driven business it doesn't always feel like that but having been at the coal face plenty of times absolutely show me the data right it's it's like the old auditors saying right show me show me show me so this is where monitoring will become more and more um, as the state of knowledge improves and as the requirements of these operators in, increase so who decides look it's the epa and it's also management who's in control of the operation and whether they feel that they have satisfied the GED. Because in the event of something happening without adequate monitoring, well, the EPA are going to go them for criminal GED fail. And so no business wants to walk around with a almost $2 million bill or a fine and five years, you know, up to five years in prison um, for failing to monitor something. So when as Jack, Jackie said, you know, the first one or two years they were pretty light on, had the kid gloves on, they're starting to actually ramp up and starting to push this, you know, you need to demonstrate better compliance than you did the previous year. So it's the EPA, but it's also what we're willing to accept, you know, from the community. Does the EPA have the depth of knowledge around the operational side of things to really be able to make that call on the monitoring? Well, I, I don't know how many EPA people are in here today, but uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, look, it, it depends on um, a few factors. It's if, if you could go to the next slide, actually, it sort of cool. ties this in. So it goes to a few factors. So uh, Jackie showed this before, but here, here's your risks versus your re regulatory burden. And so up the top of the pyramid, you've got the licences, which is the highest risk highest burden. So around those, there will be the greatest push for compliance around monitoring and those and, and registration down the bottom. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question, but it, it sort of depends. It's this bespoke thing again, you know, depends what level you're operating at and what type of business. L? Andrew, I might just pipe in there and help answer that. Uh, for example, EPA do have uh, teams of people who are 
um, experts in, in the field. Uh, so if you run a landfill, there are landfill teams that will come out who deal exclusively with landfills and um, and the aspects of them. Uh, so they they do know, they're very familiar with what a landfill looks like, smells like, and uh, should look like. Yes, yeah, subject matter experts they're referred to. I didn't mean to be unnecessarily provocative. I was just thinking about, you know, the focus of the GED is really around have you got your machine running really well and, you know, minimising emissions, et cetera. It's all pretty specific, you know, to you know, even down to plant, right, you know. Is it and, running at its optimum? What you'll find is that the EPOs that come out to site, the Environmental um, Protection Officers, they probably have a very general knowledge. And then when you go through licensing, um, typically you're dealing with the science team at McLeod or in town, and they are very specific, very knowledgeable. They have sub subject matter experts that cover everything from waste to energy to anaerobic digestion to microbiological contamination. So when you start dealing with those people, they're the ones that sort of deal with the policy and the actual how-to um, of a licence. So that's where you get those specific things in the licensing. Okay. Um, Alan? Okay, so I guess that brings us, um, how do you develop a good monitoring plan? So, um, you know, you really want to build yourself a an effective monitoring plan that's also defensible uh, if something did go wrong. So, I mean, look, short of reading through a list here, but um, you've really got to understand what you what can go wrong on your site. So, for example, here you're assessing uh, you're assessing risk, which we've been through. I won't bore you all again with that one. Um, it's about understanding the EPA's requirements and they can be very specific depending on the operation and your permission. So sometimes they can be, uh, again, to, to site a landfill, they may give you a specific size of that tip face that you're allowed to um, to tip waste in. Um, some some licences will, will allow you to look at a second face, but that's under certain conditions. So they're very specific with some things. The higher the risk of the operation, again, that's when they're going to get more specific about it. Um, good systems and controls. Absolutely, this goes without saying. This this goes from um, your your administrative system through to your your um, qualitative uh, monitoring uh, systems and that sort of stuff. So you've really got to have good ones and check them to make sure they're working and they're effective. And of course. Um, you know, documented regular inspections. Every time you make an inspection, you've got to document it to be able to prove that you've been doing what you can to minimise the risk of that operation. If EPA's requirements are specific right, to, your, to your facility and if someone's starting from scratch on this process, what's... What's the best way for them to understand EPA's requirements? Read the publications. But that'll be general, won't it? Um, no, they're actually, I mean, there's so many of them. I mean, it almost covers everything, but um, they are quite general, but they also have fairly specific examples as well. Um, and then, you know, that's sort of to put the framework around it because only you will know your business um, as well as anyone else. So it, it sort of requires the individual assessing it to know where the, the different risks sit. And so that's a very bespoke thing. Again, you know, a tyre retreader is different to a liquid waste treatment facility and a landfill. The risks are different, but the person that starts that business and is in management control of that business should fully understand and have a state of knowledge of what the risks are around that business. And typically that's the EPA position um, they will take. If you're operating a business, you should know how to operate that business without polluting the environment. That's the way that, that's the black and white way that it is generally viewed by them. Pretty unforgiving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, next slide. Yes, please. All right, so monitoring, there's monitoring and there's monitoring. So if we if we look at it, um, EPA permissions are heavy on uh, their monitoring requirements and conditions uh, 
require demonstrable knowledge uh, monitoring. So that's what we just went through. Um, you know, you've got to be able to demonstrate that you're doing it um, and satisfying the requirements listed in the EPA permissions. Now, again, um, without sounding like it's a cop out, but each each uh, permission is different and some are going to be much more complicated than others. Um, some might just say you must not discharge uh, odour beyond the boundaries of the site. And you go, okay, easy, we can check the boundaries of the site um, and, and smell it every day, depending on wind direction and whatnot. But you've got to be able to demonstrate that you do that. You can't just say that you do it because, again, as Andrew mentioned before, show me, show me, show me. Uh, they're going to ask to see it. Uh, depending on your activity and the permission type, you may have different monitoring requirements. So ag again, as we just mentioned, odour on the boundary, or it could be, um, you know, you, you need to monitor odour three kilometres away down the valley of a creek that runs nearby, uh, depending on, on where it is. Um, there are general standard and specific conditions to your operation. You need to understand your permission carefully. So this is, it's gonna spell out the, the requirements of your monitoring program if you read between the lines. Um, monitoring will be subject to the level of risk your site is perceived to have by the authority. Yeah, I, I think if you ask most business owners, um, they'll say, oh no, our site's a low risk, but in reality, the, 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 uh, the authority may see it differently. <laughs> Uh, it's about understanding that and making sure you've got the controls in place. Okay, so um, monitoring versus monitor monitoring, right? So this is qualitative versus quantitative monitoring. So uh, quantitative uh, being more in Richard Richard's ballpark, you know, specific tests that are performed by um, computer, they're recorded, they're logged, um, they're extrapolated, you know, that, that is a specific quantitative measurement that is required by some licences and and just under the GED. Um, then there's a lot of qualitative um, testing that needs to be done, whether we've accepted the right material, whether our stockpiles are compliant, um, you know, any manner of those. Is dust observable? Is steam observable? And, and you know, licences specifically mention those. So not everything can be tested and measured with a probe, but when it does, when it is required, you have to have it and you have to have those records um, kept for five years. So having some type of system that not only record, records that, but also holds that data for the five years that you need to under the law, um, that's a critical step in, in managing your facility, complying with the licence and the GA date. Next slide, please. So perfect, um, here we go into quantitative. So you have specific grams per minute from the stack, carbon monoxide or hydro, um, hydrochloric acid. This is um, pretty typical for a waste to energy type facility or any um, incineration type facility. So, you know, there's heavy metals, there's um, particles, mercury. So they're things that need to be tested um, continuously in order to have that permission um, to, to incinerate waste then you have the qualitative so things that can be done and documented on a on a daily checklist or something you know are there visible emissions other than steam so if you had a waste to energy facility um and you were doing a burn um and black smoke was coming out you know well i don't think there is a a, a quantitative way to measure black smoke right so that's a visual observation as same with anything to do with waste acceptance, anything to do with um, odours or litter um, past the boundary of your site, they, these are observable. So you can't have a monitoring process other than uh, physical documentation and, and a walk, you know, a daily walk. So can't underestimate the value of a daily check of your site. It's um, hugely important for a lot of businesses. Um, and then next slide, please. Oh, yeah. So it's not always practical to monitor with electronic probes. Um, where you can, it's certainly a great way to do it, um, recording that data. But sometimes it just it, the, the risk might not call for it. Uh, the operation might not be large enough to spend uh, the money 
on that sort of monitoring plan. Uh, this comes back to what Jackie was saying earlier about the reasonable practicabil practicability about it, of it. Um, so if we look at some common activities that require manual monitoring on site, um, you know, things like stormwater management, odour, dust, noise, human actions, um, waste types accepted, uh, stockpile dimensions, you know, CRWM storage is a, is a massive um, requirement of the EPA, making sure you store things. So if there is a fire, you've got it, you've got the, the place laid out in such a way that it's going to minimise the threat of that fire. Uh, so, you know, you can't use um, uh, probes to measure, uh, measure the current size of a, of a, um, of a stockpile. Um, and in most cases, if you can, um, it's probably not going to be, so, uh, it's probably going to, the cost is probably going to outweigh the risk of that operation. Some of these, of course, can be done with probes, but again, it comes back to the reasonable practicability of it. So, um, you know, even contamination levels, uh, housekeeping, um, water volumes in your, in your um, fire water storage dam, for example, there's lots of things that require manual monitoring and recording of it. But harping on it again, you must record this information to prove it. Yep. So um, here's a bit of a breakdown of the different permissions. So uh, we do a bit of work in this space, sort of reviewing um, who's who in the zoo and market research. So here's sort of like a snippet of um, what the breakdown is of operating licenses, permits and registrations in the state of Victoria. Um, so sewerage, 204 licenses and, you know, 19 landfills. Uh, the A13A, they're the large waste recovery facilities, uh, think Clean Away and Visi, and then, you know, milk, cement, extractive industry. So there's, there's a lot of people in this space, 672 operators with a license, and I I think that's including people with exemptions as well. Um, so permits, they're mostly trucks, um, as is registrations. And then the A13C waste recovery facilities, they're like your little transfer stations. They're your ma and pop type facilities. Anything under 4,500 cubic metres and not reportable priority wastes. So um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, a bunch of common conditions. Um, so these licenses are very echoey. So you'll obviously notice a lot of common tropes between them. So you have um, decommissioning plans, you have the need for administrative controls around notifications um, to the EPA for certain events, um, your performance information and performance statements, a permission information performance statement. Um, you've also got uh, your five years retention of records. You've got your a need for maintenance, um, which is a common, it's a standard condition, which I didn't include there, sorry. And then your risk and your financial assurance. So usually when you've got an, an, an operating license or a permit, um, you know, these are the things that you'll have to do regardless of what the activity actually is. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so... We've done a bit of a breakdown. So um, here at A13C, which is your registration for a transfer station, this is, I think, Knox, um, Knox Council, think Burundara, think any of these transfer stations that you go to on the weekend. The A13Bs, you're probably more commercial style, fairly large. And then your A13As, which are the big end of town, they have over 10,000 10, metres of material coming in they are significant operations. Think clean away, think busy. So just a little score sheet underneath each of those, you kind of have the administrative controls, um, which is the notification to the EPA becoming more burdens burdensome the higher up you go. Um, and then, you know, your requirements around systems, maintenance and risk all increase as you go from an A13C to an A13A. Notice that none of them actually include training as a condition. Um, that is because it, it's not something that they'll measure on a license performance, but they'll measure um, companies when they come in to review your systems and your procedures and your training records. 
And so it's very important to make sure that you've got those independent of what your license is telling you to do. These are things that will be asked for um, external to that under the GED, not under your license. Does the audit process overlap with this or is that separate? Uh, it does for specific sites, landfills in particular. I'd say your extractive industries have probably got a fairly strong, robust um, auditing process. These sites probably don't get audited that much. I know that there's a provision um, for relicensing sites every five years. So that might be sort of counted as an audit, I guess. And basically, even if you've got a business that's been running, you need to reapply for that license after five years and you it's basically like starting again. And so the EPA hits the reset button, goes, all right, show me why you want to continue this business and let's, you know, let's increase the level of compliance. Here's your old environmental management plan. Where's your new one? You know, where's your new monitoring plan? So this is sort of the, the road that we can see the EPA starting to um, set a path for. Um, for people so do you think that frequency is a bit high or do you think it's sensible um good question when i'm running an owner facility i'll definitely say it's too frequent and it should be once every 10 years but as a as an advisor and an environmental advisor absolutely it should be three years so <laughs> um it depends on which side of the fence you sit on look i think five years is probably as low as you would want to go but it does seem a little bit like it's a bit of a green tape burden but if you if you're running the right processes and everything there shouldn't be anything needed you know you should have been working the quality management system improvements you should have been monitoring everything so it should be a bit of a cakewalk right but you know we'll find out in two years time i guess and we we haven't seen yet what what that looks like it could just be a review and and you know prove that you've been doing the right thing show us that could be essentially an audit function that renews it we just don't know yet we haven't seen it so yeah not old enough yet the, the new act so uh, here we have uh, an extractive, an example of an extractive industry license. So you'll notice that there's the DCOM element, there's the PIPs element, there's the financial, is there a financial assurance? Probably not on this one, but there are a whole bunch of elements, especially around risk uh, maintenance and those things. And then specifically, it has a reference to schedule appendix six, which is where obviously, Richard, you step into it. Um, I hear, um, so... What do I see on there? Arsenic flow rate, pH meters. Um, so, and plenty of things to monitor. That's yeah, the... absolutely. And and um, so, and and these types of businesses, they need to monitor these um, these sources, these um, discharge points, because that's how they get the permission to operate. And so, if it's a profitable, successful business, then the monitoring of the environmental stuff shouldn't stop their ability to continue um if, if businesses say well if i need to protect the environment i may as well shut up shop well that's a that's a judgment call from management on that one so the epa are fairly um straightforward in in their approach to um regulating these businesses <laughs> it can be can be pretty blunt sometimes so they should be yeah well um, we've got a composter as an example. So um, not so much monitoring from a quantitative point of view. We've got a lot of qualitative checks for a, a composter. So you have um, the appendix four, which is your waste types. You need to view those. You know, there isn't a monitor yet that Richard can sell that um, has, you know, the ability to determine what's different between uh, W underscore four and K300. So that is a human monitoring point then also how many tonnes can you accept? 100,000 tonnes. So again, um, that comes down to uh, physical monitoring. Um, there is a lot of testing that happens with composting on the, out, on the outflow of material. You need to prove that it's fit for purpose for sale, but that's not a specific condition under the licence. And so we can skip. And then finally, we've got um, a cement business. I sort of, I picked a few different, different ones. Um, and here we have a dust collection element that's required. So um, that's a, a quantitative monitoring process that it's required at this cement facility. 
Uh, there's only two in Victoria, so I'm pretty sure that it would be a standard condition. And then again, um, you have the same elements. You have your PIPs, your risk monitoring management plan, um, and just all the standard conditions for any business. So a fairly low administration for risk two, maintenance one, systems four. So not as highly regulated as an A13A or, or some of those other more um, nuanced businesses. Hello. Um, <laughs> okay, so in summary here, if uh, if we look at everything we've just gone through um, and what Jackie touched on earlier, um, you really need to prepare your business because it's about that prevention aspect of it. So you need to know your business, your duties and your obligations. Um, you need to identify and control your risks and make sure that you've covered them all. Are you confident that you've covered them all? Because, you know, it's it's... Murphy's law that if something is going to go wrong, it'll be the one that you haven't covered. Um, uh, check and understand your permission. Make sure you know that intimately because that's your ticket to ride, basically. Um, maintain your equipment regularly. Again, keep your documentation on to be able to prove that you've done it. Some uh, environments are going to require a lot more maintenance and it's going to be a lot more difficult to maintain that equipment than in other environments. But that's the game that you were in. So you, you really need to be doing that. Confirm you use lawful transporters and places of disposal when you're um, when you're moving waste. Uh, the last thing you want to do is offload something that um, goes to a dodgy operator and it gets dumped down the road and you end up getting uh, pinged for it. Um, so you that waste is your responsibility. Uh, ensure you're storing and handling materials correctly. Um, ensure your employees are trained and aware of their duties too. And again, that comes back to those in, um, that environmental management system um, yeah. where those documents that set out what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, the procedures that are attached to that and the risk assessments that are attached to that are, um, are trainable items. Uh, develop good practices being house housekeeping and record keeping have your policies in, in place and on display. It's just, it's just good practice to do that um, and have good documentation. It's just so important. It really is that the proof of you doing the right thing. And with all the documentation that you have, if you say you're going to do it in your documentation, make sure you do it. Because the last thing you want to see on an EPA uh, notice is you have failed to follow your own documentation because that... It's not a great position to be in, I'd imagine, but you do see it occasionally. Yeah, you do. And that that pretty much summarises what um, what uh, what we've talked about. Really, that's um, th thanks for the opportunity to. Yeah, thanks, uh, Richard. Us. Thanks very much. I'm going to cut you off there because we're tight for time and we've got yeah. some questions to go through. But that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, what does this all mean in terms of monitoring and monitoring systems? Um, you really need to design your monitoring program to match this. Um, and you need to think carefully about what the specification needs to be. A classic is something like a flow meter, where people might try to save money and use an impeller, but it stops working after six months. So being able to maintain these systems, these monitoring systems, becomes really important. Um, you've got to be able to configure it, you've got to be able to install it properly in accordance with manufacturer's requirements. And then you really need a way of oversighting the monitoring system. So, you know, we put a lot of effort into remotely oversighting monitoring networks that we put in. Um, because this maintenance and reporting and oversight is just the same as any other responsibility under the GED. It doesn't just apply to plant. It also applies to the monitoring that you're doing to keep an eye on that plant. So same obligations apply. So it is, an, it is a real step up in terms of what's required in terms of monitoring of operational facilities. Um, it's a good thing in the long term, but it is a fair bit of work to get there. So that's something that HydroTerra is doing a lot of at the moment. Now I'm going to move straight on to the questions. Um, we've got about, Jackie has to head off at two o'clock. So we've got about 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, so I'll just charge through these.
question number one. Are you there, Jackie? Is Jackie with us? Yep. Hi, Richard. I'm back. Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, how much contaminated soil or earth needs to be removed and sent to landfill? Please define as per various scale and contamination types. Like everything we've said today, Richard, that really depends on what the site is, what the contamination is, what the preliminary site investigations revealed. I mean, you really need to be sampling, sampling, sampling and really trying to sort of find exactly how deep, how wide, how long these things are. And if you're looking for EPA publications for this, if for your listeners, EPA Vic publication 2008, 1977 and 1940 will be a good starting point for you to have a bit of reading. Excellent answer. Number two, could you elaborate on how the new EPA regulations in Victoria impact the handling of digestate from biogas plants? I'll have a go at this one too. So this feels like it's a microbiological contamination um, issue is that um, it, it's regarded as an N205, um, the EPA really pushing for people to compost this AD um, offtake after the digestate. Um, I know there is possible ways to get a designation or a determination around these materials, but it again becomes a specific site-specific issue. The feedstock's quite bespoke. If you've got E. coli going in, you've got E. coli coming out, you need to make sure that you're trying to reduce the risk and the harm to the human health and the environment. And microbiological risk is also included under the EPA's remit. Okay, very good answer. <laughs> uh, number three, and uh, I think Jacqueline, this could be in your court, <laughs> success in the mining industry of using GED as a defence against DESI, DESI prosecution regarding non-compliance with and EA conditions. Thanks, Richard. It's a um, quite a specific scenario, um, and one that I'm not um, not aware of as to whether there's any precedent or cases um, that have done this. But um, um, there, there are certain principles that do translate in terms of um, minimisation of risk in the the extractive industry um, legislative regime as well. Um, but I'm not, I, I, I can't speak to any specific examples that I'm aware of, um, but um, it, where I've, I've seen this scenario. Is it a bit like saying, like, if you're, if you're trying really hard, <laughs> so your general environment and duty, I'm really, really trying hard on that, that you'll get, given a bit of a leave pass at the other end. Is that what we're sort of saying? Is, does it work like that? Trying or... hard isn't always going to cut the mustard um, <laughs> when it comes to a prosecution, Richard. Um, but, you know, the, the way that the general environmental duty, you know, I will say is framed is um, it's going to require a different type of um, uh, evidentiary proof. And, um, you know, where I think we're all waiting to to see the first one of these um, GED prosecutions contested and, and um, you know, certainly the lawyers in terms of making case law and what, what the expectations will be. Um, you know, it was it was a concept that was brought from the occupational health and safety um, regime, but, um, you know, we have to just treat that case law with a, um, you know, a slight degree of caution given it, it is, um, you know, the, the provisions are, almost identical, but um, they come from a different framework and applying that you know, there's a bit of a principle in law about applying um, case law and provisions from other legislative regimes. Um, you can just have to treat that with a degree of caution. Um, yes. When so, you say legislative regimes, do you mean different acts? Different acts. So that, that, that means acts and regulations and the interpretation that comes with it. So the, the law that comes from the case, uh, from the courts. Yes. It's it's a lawyer speak for talking about the acts and the regs. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. So it's um 
I know you're not allowed to go between regimes, but just looking uh, hypothetically for a moment under the OHS side of things, that question regarding GED, like, is there an equivalent? Has that sort of played out where if people have been largely operating really, really carefully, that there has been some kind of leniency showed or is that? Um, well, there, there has, you know, there is, um, you know, the, the OHS regime has been around for quite a lot longer and there is, um, you know, there is a history of work safe prosecutions um, and you would have seen recently we've had, um, you know, the first man's, um, industrial manslaughter um, cases going through. Um, it, it, it is... It is a it is a different regime, Richard. Um, and but there are there are instances where there have been um action or enforcement actions taken where um you know there's not there's not necessarily harm caused, but it, you know there's a failure in the system. Um, so we have seen examples of cases where that that has occurred where you don't necessarily need to see the resultant harm for there to have been a prosecution. Okay. Thank you. Um, number four, I am interested in your perspective around including traditional owners in this work. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I, I see no reason why you couldn't. Um, I guess monitoring is monitoring. I guess where it would be uh, the logical choice to use traditional owners if you had a site of uh, Indigenous significance um, th that uh, you're working around, you should be monitoring that to make sure it's not disturbed. And, you know, uh, using a traditional owner group in that instance that understands the significance would probably be a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Number five, when compliance is not sufficient to assure community members concerned over environmental emissions. I'll take that one if you like, Richard. Um, <laughs> sure. the, uh, some, some of your um, webinar listeners may or may not know, but the, one of the new features of the Act is that there is a provision for third-party enforcement proceedings to be commenced. So uh, apart from the EPA being a regulator for non-compliances, um, individuals or um, organisations who can establish standing are able to bring actions where um, there has been an alleged non-compliance. So usually the, that person will need to uh, establish that they have an interest in the matter and um, where that, you know, there, there might be a threshold question about that, they need to have shown also that they've um, approached the EPA and um, the EPA has failed to take action. Um, we haven't seen that um, section um, being utilised in any of any of the matters that I'm aware of, but it, I guess it is a residual concern for, for some duty holders who, you know, may be doing everything they can to demonstrate that they, they see themselves as compliant, but there are always going to be members of the community who may um, hold duty holders to, uh, you know, a higher level of, um, of, of standard um, over and above what what the regime might require and you know that's always going to be a very difficult issue to deal with and and hopefully um you know they've got some some good assistance from a stakeholder engagement perspective in in managing those issues but it, you know it's certainly a you know a critical issue in terms of um social license and and ensuring acceptance in the community um for for activities it is an interesting interface there between the GED and, I guess, social licence to operate. And it's sort of a mechanism that has flexibility, but the sky's the limit. And yeah. the more noise that people make, the higher up you're going to head towards the sky. I can see it sort of <coughs> getting a bit messy at times. But um, who ultimately sorts out if it's practicable or not? Is that the EPA? Like if someone asks, you know, for a dust monitor every two metres along a fence and um, they say, no, that's not practical, we can't afford that, 
then does the EPA get consulted or how does that work? That's a really good question, Richard. Um, it'll probably, you know, that the ultimate arbiter will be if a, you know, if there's a action brought, it'll be up to the court to decide um, if, you, if they can't agree. Right. Courts might get busy. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's quite right. Okay. Um, how are we going for time? We've got six minutes left. We'll keep charging on. I have to disappear. <laughs> All right. Um, do you think that a G, I think they mean the GED, is the GED is very Victorian. Do you think it might get picked up by other jurisdictions in the future? Oh. Brief, I did briefly touch on this. Other jurisdictions do have a GED, um, but the distinction we have in Victoria is that ours is um, backed up by, it's an enforceable duty with, with civil and criminal penalties, which is a bit different. So I, I suspect, you know, Victoria is now the high watermark and the high threshold in terms of compliance. I wouldn't be surprised if in time other jurisdictions move to that. We've already seen an overhaul um, or new legislation introduced in New South Wales um, to increase penalties and fines. So, I, you know, I think that um, if you're a betting person, that would be a, you know, a reasonable bet to make that um, others might follow suit. So in other states, you're saying it's not enforceable. Is that right? Not enforceable by way of a prosecution or um, civil proceedings. It could be enforced um through uh, through enforcement action or through notices, but you can't you can't be found guilty of failing to comply with the GED. That's pretty soft outside Victoria. <laughs> um, that's just my opinion by the sense of it. Um, can you recommend testing and water quality instrument suppliers? Absolutely. That's why Hydroterra exists. Just give us a call. Number eight. What is the obligation to operators who see a pollution pattern but where there is not yet a reasonably practicable... Oh, I just need to close that. In mitigation. This is, this is another one of those that uh, really... It sounds case-specific. Um, <laughs> uh, where... You know how long's a piece of string on this one? How how bad's the effect? Can it be stopped? Is it could it reasonably be stopped? Is there a solution out there that the person might not be aware of? Um, from an EPA, from our understanding of an, the EPA perspective, um, if you're polluting the environment, the EPA will tell you to stop. Now, whether that can be stopped or not, um, it might be something like a uh, beneath a landfill it's leaching into groundwater or something that's very difficult to stop i i don't know the answer to it um to the, without going right into the specifics and looking into it the next one looks like jackie relevance to local government authorities uh, well, I think to the extent that any local government authority is uh, carrying out activities that might cause um, risks of human risks of risk to human health or the environment, um, where where there's pollution or waste, they, they they will be captured by the general environmental duty. And we know that a number of local government authorities, um, you know, operate landfills um, and other um, waste and resource recovery operations, um, but also local government authorities have a role on the side of the regulator in terms of litter controls um, as well and the monitoring aspects that come from those. So I see local government as kind of having a, you know, a, a dual-faced um, role. So they're in the loop just as much as everyone else. Yes, that's right, exactly. Number 10, what kinds of gaps or misconceptions are you seeing around the GED and state of knowledge where SO? State of knowledge. State of knowledge. Yeah. State of knowledge, yes. state of knowledge manifests is qualified. Um, well, this sort of, again, it sort of depends, but it's sort of um, everyone assumes that they're, they're doing the right thing, that their business is... You know they're in it. They they're so used to the risks of the operation, 
um, that they don't know what other people are doing or what best practice is. If unless they're part of um, associations or membership groups or they're going off and, and reviewing other facilities so they have something to benchmark against, the EPA are out there benchmarking all the time and they're always looking at the best, the worst, the in-between. And so that's where there's gaps and misconceptions is that people don't cross-pollinate with other, other sites enough. And so get out and have a look at what your competitors are doing and, yeah, try and try and keep up with the Joneses. All right. Well, I believe we've run out of time. Um, I really want to thank everyone for sticking around for so long. And I really want to thank our presenters. It's been very informative, fantastic job from you all. And um, there's quite a few questions that we haven't managed to get to today. Apologies for that, but we'll send out some email answers to you all about those questions. Um, so thanks very much to our presenters, Jackie, Andrew and Alan. We'll let Jackie run off to her meeting, which is... <laughs> like lawyers by the clock, but that's excellent. So um, thanks very much, everyone. Really appreciated it. Thanks, thanks Richard. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye. 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 Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us again. This is a very unusual addition to our webinar, which covered uh, environmental monitoring requirements, a changing game, understanding your GED and compliance obligations, a legal and operational perspective. All viewers of this should also refer back to the original webinar um, for the full scope of the presentation. But today's presentation is to cover off on a number of questions that were raised during last week's webinar that we did not have time to answer at that time. So thanks very much for those questions. And we will be putting this webinar up on our website. Before we commence, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Ivatera respectfully acknowledges the Boon Warung people of the Kulin Nation where we are located today. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We're very lucky to have all of our presenters back again. So there's my, myself, Richard Campbell, Managing Director of Hydroterra, Jacqueline Plant, partner with Norton Rose Fulbright, Andrew Swan, Principal from Circular Resources Australia, and Alan Cummins, who's also a principal from Circular Resources Australia. All right, so magnificent set of questions from the webinar, and thank you to all of those who did raise those. We didn't get to address all of them, so we've made an abridged version of the questions that didn't, we didn't get to. So I'm just going to read these questions out, and the panel's going to answer them. Question number one. How can we prove to the EPA that we have implemented reasonably practicable controls? The wording is very subjective and therefore if a pan or infringement is disputed by the organisation, it can be difficult to argue. All right, Jackie, what do you think? Thanks, Richard. It might be a bit of a... Um... A joint uh, response to the answer. Um, in terms of the reasonably practicable controls, you might recall in the webinar we discussed what the various factors are that come from the Environment Protection Act in making up um, what's reasonably practical. The, the factors like the likelihood of harm, um, the degree of, of risk, what control measures are in place. And so um, from a legal perspective, if you were in the situation of um, there being a, an investigation or a compliance query from the EPA about whether you had had implemented those reasonably practical controls, I would suggest you go back to look at those factors and work out what evidence you do have to satisfy each of those elements. Um, I think our 
our um, webinar listener is right in, in pointing out that um, there is a subjective element to what's reasonably practicable because it does depend on the particular activity um, and the degree of risk that is posed by that particular activity. And the whole idea of the GED is that it isn't one size fits all and there are going to be differences between activities. But I think if um, you, you gather the evidence that you've got for each of those factors. And there's also quite a useful EPA publication. I think it's um, publication 1856, which sets out um, the EPA's guidance on what's reasonably practicable. It's also, it's good to refer back to um, what the EPA's guidance is. And, you know, as Andrew and Alan both said, making sure that you've got your records and you've got good, um, you know, good practical, tangible evidence of what you've done that is going to go a long way in terms of being able to demonstrate to the EPA that what the, the measures that you've come up with having regard to those, those factors in the reasonably practicable test in the Act, what the guidance from the EPA says um, will help you build up that case about what you've done to comply um, with your duties. Andrew and Ellen, um, what would you like to add to that? So, look, I think on the ground, um, when an EPA officer comes to site, um, they will usually tell you that there's things that they do like and that they don't like. And if you show that you're willing to um, listen and, and fix where appropriate, um, you know, a pandering infringement's less and less likely the more and more receptive you are to change and adaption. Um, records and risk assessments, obviously really good and you know, any systems that you have, you've just got to stick to them. Don't say that you're going to do something and don't do it. Um, that's, a, you know, that's a own goal. So it will really come down to what are you doing on the site and are you being receptive to the EPA officer? Um, they don't like being told, funnily enough, this is how we've always done it and, you know, go away. So, you know, be nice. Uh, be be um, respectful and, and listen. Right. Um, I guess with respect to that, are you really saying that it's a Alan was gonna, Sorry, Richard. I think Alan had a an addendum there as well. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Richard. I was on mute, so uh, I was oh. I was talking away, but no one was hearing me, <laughs> which is understandable. Um, look, I think it comes back to state of knowledge as we went through in the last webinar as well. Uh, if you're running an operation, you're expected to know um, what the risks are and appropriately controlling those risks. So if you're actively engaged in a space, the EPA will expect you to be knowledgeable in the controls that you should have in that space. Okay, so... In the world as it is now, if um, it, it seems to me that this speaker's question is sort of worried that EPA will come to site and say, look, you haven't put in what's reasonably practicable. But in the real world, is it they'll come and say, well, we'd like you to put this in. We feel that you haven't done enough. Yeah. And then there'll be another step, right? And if they don't follow that guidance, that's when things could get nasty. But up until that point, you know. Absolutely. That, that's absolutely right, Richard. You know, this is a relationship and, and you know, the only reason that they'll give you a pan or an infringement notice is if you're not listening and, and being obstructive. That's what I'm, that's what um, <laughs> I see on the ground. Um, sometimes EPA can sort of miss the mark a little bit but that's when you need to sort of go back with with clear evidence, clear controls, clear systems, and good and a good business typically has those, and that's yeah, yeah. And the process usually goes along the lines of um, a draft improvement notice gets sent to you first, and then you'll get an improvement notice after that's finalised. And then if you fail to comply with that, that's when you're probably looking at your um, at your infringement sort of area. Okay, that makes sense. So it's collaborative with EPA after oh, yeah. that um, first meeting. All right, good answers there. Question number two, if there is a new control or method to minimise risks to human health and the environment that is reasonably practical and a current state of knowledge, 
but no reference in any EPA guidance, can EPA enforce the GED for not implementing it? It's a good question, Richard. Um, I, my answer to that would be, well, the, the state of knowledge concept that we talked about will involve um, ideas about um, what measures you need to take or controls to take that come from a variety of sources. So EPA guidance is just one of those sources of um, uh, knowledge relevant to the um, concept of state of knowledge. Though so there, as, as I talked about in the webinar, there are other sources of um, guidance that that make up um, the body of knowledge for the state of knowledge. So it, I guess not all measures to satisfy what's reasonably practicable are going to come from EPA guidance. It's, you know, as, as we keep saying, there's going to be, um, you know, variation between activities um, and each duty holder about what's reasonably practicable in the circumstances. And it, I think um, it, it, it really does, it will, will really come down to a question of is it reasonably practical in the particular circumstances that apply. Okay. Alan or Andrew, do you want to add to that? Look, all I could say is that typically a new control method isn't just invented and, and rolled out. I mean, these things take years and years to get out there. They're usually well known. No one's going to be surprised that, you know, you should do this or that. You know, if they, these things, are they already exist. There's very few new inventions in this space. I think you need to talk to Hydra Terra for all sorts of new. What's monitoring. their number? <laughs> all right. Question number three Can EPA prescribe elimination of contaminated soil when there are reasonably practicable measures to render the site suitable for use, therefore capping in situ? Did you want me to go first? Sure, Jackie. <laughs> we're, we're setting a bit of a theme here. Um, some yeah. of us probably have slightly more of a legal um, bent to them and other questions coming up might um, might be good to throw to Alan and Andrew first. But um, uh, there are fairly prescribed circumstances about um, when you can reuse uh, or uh, maintain um, contaminated spoil or sorry contaminated soil on site um, and often it will come down to um, how the relevant landowner or the person who's in management and control of that site has um, assessed the risk that's posed by that contaminated soil and be able to satisfy the EPA about whether it is appropriate having regard to um, you know, the level of risk posed by that contaminated material about whether it is um, appropriate to remain on site and remain in situ. So to, I guess to directly answer the question, there are certain, there are times when the EPA can say that the, the risk that might be posed by leaving material on site would be unacceptable in the circumstances and um, does need to be removed. And often the way that that is um enforced is through um, an environmental action notice or an improvement notice um, to ensure that that happens if it's not going to happen as part of um, the management of contaminated land duty. So part of management, uh, uh, sorry, the contaminated land duty requires people to make an, you know, an assessment of, um, of, of the risks that are posed by contamination that's present on the site. Yeah, so preliminary site investigations and, and um, the NEPM, the assessment of ground, the site contamination, which is the Schedule B1. So, you know, it depends on what the use is. Is it industrial, commercial? Is it going to be a kindergarten? So those factors sort of play into it as well. But just thinking about it from the context of the GED versus, you know, a change of land use trigger, if um, if there is a potential for, you know, I don't know, let's say it's uh, leachate to be generated 
and that leads out to migrate off site in the past. The trigger from that would normally have been a change in land use that would lead to, you know, assessment and that sort of thing, whereas this is sort of more of an operational context. So do you think it's sort of like EPA's got a second bite of the cherry with respect to contamination management through the GED? I'm not sure about that. I feel that, you know, all of these cases are so bespoke and, and case by case, it really depends on the specifics, like everything. <laughs> okay. Hope that helps. Question number four. Can EPA take action on an officer or individual for their actions or inaction conducting environmental monitoring? Or is there a lapse in taking action on results? So I think that's meant to be... I can, have another, sorry, I can jump in on that one, Richard. Um, so the way the, um, the Environment Protection Act is set up is that um, the, the general environmental duty applies to both individuals as well as organization so it would if if the requirement or the need to do environmental monitoring um was was triggered by or was by a um a, a company having the general environmental duty apply to it um there are provisions in the act that say where an organization um fails to but to to meet its general environmental duty, individual officers um, of, of that organisation can also be found guilty of the same offence as the company. So um, there, there is the potential that individual officers can, you know, can also be pursued for action where the organisation um, has also or has not complied with its general environmental duty. The, you know, I think the question here is the, the, if there's a there's an individual and the, the individual could be the subject of um, enforcement action if that um, if the the duty was applicable just to that individual. But you know, there is that that um, corporate um, responsibility for officers as well. So that you know that um, you know to our mind is super important for people who are managers. Um, and officers who, you know, are in control of um, giving direction and responsible for training and, and all of those things that um, organisations do to make sure that the organisation is compliant as well as then, I guess, protecting themselves as individuals and that potential for individual exposure. And, and sometimes it comes down to did the... Did the the company check that the checks were being done. So it sort of comes down to that system. You know, the business needs to consider every action that its employees have and to make sure that they're being done. So that sort of ties the whole company in typically uh, rather than just focusing on an individual. And that comes back to a key component of the GED, which is training. So you've got to, you've got to train your staff. It's going to open up a bit of a, <laughs> uh, it's interesting to think about monitoring. Um, what is a complete monitoring program? So we do continuous monitoring, say for landfill gas on the perimeter. And then you've got someone whose license requirement says you only need to do it quarterly. And we know the concentrations go up and down a lot. I mean, is under the GED, would it be considered more appropriate to be doing it continuously if we know that it does vary so much? I'd imagine that would come back to what's reasonably practicable. Um, if you can do it and, and you do it, I think. Mm. Well, it could be good for business. <laughs> yes, potentially. You know, there's circumstances where you might have seasonal variations Richard, or um, or you know that you think of the landfill example where you um, you, you you take 
measurements of leachate and it can vary significantly from every time you take a sample, you might get a slightly different result. So having that trend data can help, um, you know, demonstrate what your level of compliance is over a period of time. And if there is an outlying result that, you know, it's easier to explain that way, or at least, you know, from a non-technical perspective, that's um that's been my um my experience. Andrew, um you look like you might have something else to add to that. I was just saying hopefully you can explain it. Yes, yes, yes. We, we we'd always like to hope so. <laughs> okay. Well that sounds good. Um, when the concept of a GED was socialised by EPA and DECA prior to the introduction of the new EPA Act, there was a promise of less prescriptive conditions in licences and a performance outcome model. <laughs> Do you have any comments on this failure? Hmm. I guess um, my initial concept would be that if you didn't have prescriptive conditions, what would you get measured against? And so without sort of having a fence around your requirements, then what are you being measured against? And so you kind of need to be a little bit prescriptive um, in order to get the right outcome. I certainly recall that um, there was discussion about um, not in, not making the GED prescriptive and making sure that duty holders were given the flexibility to do whatever it is that they um, feel is required to satisfy effectively the test without necessarily being given a prescriptive list of measures and actions that need to be taken um so you know slightly different to the, the licensing framework where you are you are giving prescriptive measures but um i think you know my recollection um from from all of the the debate and the discussion that happened at the time the 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 system was being introduced was it was really about you know the ged um having that degree of flexibility and not necessarily being up to the EPA to tell um, duty holders exactly what it is that was required because, you know, that can, as Sandra said, things can change over time with, um, you know, with new controls and, you know, things evolve. So um, that was my understanding in terms of um, the, there being sort of more of a performance-based outcome um, in the GED context. Yeah, more specifically to the GED rather than the whole licensing. Yeah, and that, that's my understanding too. Is it, I know in your presentation, I think Alan or Andrew, you, you spoke about how, you know, the EMS is a certain hinge point and as long as you do what's written in your EMS, you'll, you'll be okay. Um it seems to me a fine line between prescriptive and that. Um, doesn't the whole GED just mean there's more chance for enforcement against those environmental management systems and therefore the whole lot's becoming more prescriptive? Yeah, I think you're right there, Richard. I think um, that's probably the case. Um, however, your EMS is largely there to help you comply with your license. It's basically the instruction book on how to comply with your license. So um, if that's been developed as part of an application, um, more than likely it's going to have been approved at some stage by the EPA. Now that may have changed over the years as it's as it's a live document and it gets developed, but it should get developed in the way with the business as it's maturing so if i've got a licensed facility and an approved monitoring plan by an auditor the various measures that are in my ems sort of get moved across into that approved monitoring plan with time do you think that's how it's going to evolve or how do you see that, that, that sounds 
right. I mean, the EMS monitoring plan should sort of be pointing at each other and anything to do with monitoring should be removed out of the EMS and put into the monitoring plan. So then that way you're not doubling up and having to, you know, have two documents up to date all the time. You can just have the monitoring one that does the monitoring and then the management system that does the overall system. Well, I'd, I'd see them as as part of the EMS. So your your RMMP is uh, going to be part of your EMS system. Okay. So I think we're saying the same thing effectively. It's just who you're accountable to, I suppose, and where does one process leave off and another start? If it's the same document, then that's okay. Well, Basically. sometimes the EPA specifically requests a document type, and in order to comply, you need to produce that document. And I guess later on, you can probably roll that back into your management system but if they request a stockpile management plan or some type of plan, you need to produce that and then maybe you can fold it back into your other documents later, so long as you keep the intent there. Okay. It's an interesting space, isn't it? All right. Uh, question number six. Have EPA specified what the... PIPs, P-I-P-S, should look like or what form it takes? Yes. It's an invite. <laughs> it's an invite-only type thing. They'll email you to say that, hey, your PIPs is ready. You jump on the portal and it's specific to your business. We've done a few and they're pretty easy. They're almost identical to the APS, in all honesty. So, so maybe a point just to um, highlight... Andrew, there is that um, under the old regime, um, what, I think all licenses had a requirement to submit an annual performance statement. And now yeah. um, the, the PIPs, which has essentially superseded the annual APS, um, as you said, is now essentially on request of the EPA. So there might be certain licenses that have that condition to submit a PIPs once uh, once the EPA requests it, so it's not something you have to do as of uh, you know as of requirement every every year. <laughs> yes, that used to be a very busy time for yep. for um, the EPA portal. Okay, number seven. Does GED apply to planning permit referrals review by a planner of contaminated lists? land risk therefore if there is a lapse in identifying a risk for a permit issued epa is always a referral body as is the water authority for the relevant area so the council and an epa talk more now than they have in a long time so there's sort of no hiding from that yes there's definitely i agree andrew my, that's my experience too there's a lot of dialogue that occurs between EPA at um, the, the relevant planning and um, responsible authorities and um, you know and, and other um, government departments but I think my when I read the question again I read it as um, and I think this question did come from a representative in local government they might be concerned about whether the GED applies to them when they are the um, the the uh, responsible authority assessing a planning permit or, or a planning permit um, referral or they're assessing an application. Um, I think, I don't think the GD applies to the assessment or the referral activity as such because the GD is about um, where there's an activity that's giving rise to risks of human heart, to human health or the environment, and it's not the assessment of the planning permit that's doing that, but actually whatever the activity is that might be the subject of that application is probably where the GED would come in. So the planner's obviously got a responsibility to exercise the usual level of skill and competence expected of a, a planner when they do their job and take into account any contaminated land risk um, and any you know, conditions or requirements that might need to be put on um, that relevant planning permit. But um, 
you know, compliance with the GED will otherwise be relevant to the permit applicant um, would be my response there. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, yes, yes. The GED um, is uh, very broad, as we said in its application, uh, Richard, but um, sometimes we just got to go back and um, go back to first principles about when it's actually going to be triggered or not. Okay. Question number eight. Jackie has indicated that the overwhelming number of prosecutions are related to conditions and not GED. EPA assessment of compliance against a licence condition does not take into account management of risk. For example, the licence condition, waste must not burn, does not take into account the efforts taken to minimise risk. If we have a fire, then we simply don't comply. How do we as an industry get EPA to focus on the risk-based approach that the EP Act promotes and not license condition approach that is currently being implemented? Well, I think maybe Alan and Andrew could go first on that one. What do you think? Um, well, if you've had a fire, the risk is very high. And so... <laughs> In fact, it's like a light switch. It's on or off. Um, and so if you've had a fire, the best thing that you can do is do uh, an action report or a five whys report and go through, work out where the failing was from the business. Um, and maybe it's lithium battery or something, um, which takes a lot of the risk out, you know, a lot of the management control out of it. But ultimately, there needs to be consideration to those Um risks and, and you need to update your system appropriately to avoid that from happening again. I mean, it's not much you can do, really. Yeah, the, there, the, the question of fire there. on site is a contentious one, um, especially for waste sites that receive uh, material from outside. It's not their waste. It arrives on site and, and there may be no way to stop that fire. Um, for an example, in the event of a municipal truck uh, collecting uh, curbside waste, it might have a vape in it. And once it's inside the truck and it gets pushed through the comp compaction process, uh, you know, a fire starts and it's, um, unfortunately, it's there's no real way of predicting if that's going to happen or not. And that's what makes it a very awkward place to be at the moment. It's sort of uh, a little bit about what we were talking about before where you've got your licence conditions and you've got your GED um, requirements documented in your EMS. Isn't part of the answer to this that those two are sort of coming together? So, in effect, what the EPA is trying to do is move towards this more risk-based approach through that. That's... Sure. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, Richard. I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, the only other thing I'd add to that is that it's, uh, you know, as much as it's possible is to keep the dialogue going between the duty holders and the EPA and continuing to educate the EPA about some of the practical realities of um, what, what duty holders are dealing with on site so that they, you know, that the EPA can can really get a proper handle on that and help hopefully better inform them about the realities of site operations and then hopefully take that into account in terms of the standard that they are enforcing licence conditions to and, um, and, and, and I guess being, you know, being mindful of those, those practical realities um but yes I, you know my experience is that there often is a quite a you know a literal interpretation um in some of the prosecutions where there are um you know there's a condition and it, it's you know uh, there's been a a requirement to do something in the condition that hasn't occurred in a time you know in the, the time frame that was required or it was done but it wasn't done to the epa satisfaction and sometimes it then you know, the, the fact that it's ended up in a prosecution um, 
it's obviously meant that, you know, the EPA has maybe not been satisfied about the compliance that's occurred up to that point because, it you know, it's normally quite a, a serious, um, you know, action for the EPA to, to, to take a prosecution. Um, usually there are a whole lot of steps that happen before that. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, continuing that dialogue and, you know, whether there are things that can be done at a, an industry-wide level if that is the if that is the issue about, um, you know, having that conversation about risk <coughs> dialogue. It's an interesting one because all these batteries coming onto landfills causing these fires and they really don't have much chance of avoiding that. Um, number nine, does having an ISO 14001 certified EMS satisfy the GED? No. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate? Oh, right. Uh, it doesn't? No. Um, it definitely, <laughs> it helps. <laughs> it, it, it might help. I mean, the problem with a lot of these ISO types <coughs> is that they're pay to play, they make your business look good, you get the five ticks. But honestly, you know, are businesses really using an ISO system to its full um, advantage? You know, not the ones that I've seen. I've, I've run an ISO system and, you know, they're great, but you've really got to, you know, talk forms and registers. You've got to update the documents all the time. You know, they are a core part of your business. If you're getting an ISO 14001 just to stamp it on your business, just so you can comply with the GED, save your money. Do you think, Andrew, it also depends on, you know, the scale and the size and the, the type of activity that a business is doing as to whether that type of um, the EMS is appropriate or not? Getting a certified system, absolutely, for manufacturing and for high-risk type processes where you need people to sign off on various stages of a process and acceptance of things, absolutely, that that's all, all very good. But that sort of feeds into your quality system. Typically, there's sort of like an underlying 9001 quality slant to it. So I'm, I'm not a, a huge fan of ISO 14001. And um, yeah, it's um, it's interesting to reflect on your earlier comments about how everything hinges on the EMS, and that the fact that an ISO system sort of makes sure that that's kept up to date. I sort of feel you've got a bit of an internal conflict there. Have I heard that wrong? Um, look, a good ISO system is great. But most ISO systems I've seen have been purchased um, for the ticks rather than to genuinely use a quality management system to improve your systems on site. Okay, so you'd be in favour of ISO if it was genuinely, genuine. yeah, yeah, you know. But just to just to brush it on your business is not going to help. It's not a defence. Okay. If Question. I can add to that uh, just a little bit. Um, it comes back to the the specifics of the business as well. Like you really need to get into the nuts and bolts. For example, with an environmental risk assessment or a fire risk assessment, you need to step through the realities of that business to understand the risks and develop good controls for it. You know, it's nothing stops having to do that. So just looking at it from EPA's perspective and having the manpower to actually come in and go through these EMSs and understand that business, like, do they have that? Like, I know you said earlier in the webinar that you felt they had the resources, but it's a huge amount of work, isn't it? Certainly is. It's it's a lot of visits to a lot of places. Um, absolutely, and and they they have quite a large team, I believe. But 
like any workforce at the moment, I think uh, attracting good people and maintaining them is always a difficult thing. Have they worked out how the EPA auditor program is going to interface with this yet? Jackie, Preston mentioned. Certainly the Act provides for a much greater scope of um, activities and roles that auditors can perform, and I see a lot of... Um, improvement or environmental action notices that stipulate plans or um, requirements to be performed and independently verified by an auditor outside of the audit, um, the, you know, the traditional audit role. So there is, you know, there's quite a lot of work um, being done by auditors at the requirement of the EPA in that, um, you know, in that enforcement setting. Um, but in terms of formalising it, um, I'm, I'm certainly not the expert on on the auditor um, process. So maybe that's why the EPA focus in on those prescriptive ones because it doesn't take much time to debate whether or not there's been a fire, but it might become a bigger challenge to be able to do it at the level that we've just discussed on a EMS. Um, number 10, is a monitoring sample plan required in the monitoring process? Um, who shall we ask? Jackie, are you feeling nervous about that question? Would you like to have a go at it? Oh. I'm not sure if um I don't know. I'm not sure if I know the answer exactly, Richard. Um, I think what they're getting at here is you've got a monitoring plan that's you know typically that approved environmental monitoring plan, quite prescriptive and has the auditor involved in it. And then we've got that diagram that we've sort of referred to as part of the sort of GED planning process, which has a, you know, set up your EMS and then monitor that you're actually following it effectively, I guess. Um, where do the two overlap? I think is what they're getting at. So if you've got it in one, do you need it in the other? it's a tough question it's a, <laughs> it is it's a it's probably one of the shorter questions but one of the one of the tough ones to answer i mean uh i mean in your in your risk monitoring and management plan you should if i'm understanding the question correctly um you should have uh what the sampling what the monitoring plan looks like and how often it's going to happen and in what circumstances it's going to happen um, that is the simple way to answer. I'm not sure if that answers the question, though. I think the answer is yes, if necessary, right? So yes. if we were to look at, uh, I don't know, I was discussing a site today where they've got offshore uh, off-site discharge of water, but it's um, not a licensed discharge, but uh, it might be as part of their process of you know, working out their EMS that they want to know uh, and, and they should know about the, the discharges from that and they just choose to include that as a sampling plan. Um, it's, it's going to come through to that separate evaluation process to what was traditionally done in a prescriptive way. Mm -hmm. It needs to be considered, but maybe not always required, would be my gut feeling. <laughs> All right, I think we'll move on from that short question that seemed to bring us unstuck. Uh, number 11, seems odd that you have to keep records for five years when sometimes the impact of the non-compliance or dereliction of GED may not itself be quantified or noticed until more than five years later, especially since electronic record keeping doesn't impose a huge burden on keeping records. Uh, 
I'm not sure quite where the um, reference to the five-year period comes from, if that was something we may have said in the um, the webinar. I did, I did notice that we did talk about reviews of um, permissions happening in five years, uh, the first five years. Andrew, you've got a, you've got a point to raise. Yeah, so on the five years, it was only to permits, which I made a mistake on, which um, someone corrected me on. And then the five years retention of documents is the standard um, condition OLG4B, which says that um, monitoring records need to be kept uh, retained for five years and made available to the EPA upon request. My thoughts on that would be in the event that an activity is deemed high risk, it may well be a specific licence condition that's imposed upon that, that they need to be maintained for, you know, it could be 30 years in the case of a landfill, for example. So, you know, probably subject to the type of activity that's been undertaken. Yes, I, I agree there, Alan. As the, the person who's posed the question has indicated, there might be potential impacts that don't arise um, for, you know, a very long time after the activity has, has ceased. And the landfill is the classic example there. So I think, you know, probably we'd say keep them for, you know, keep them for as long as you you, you possibly can and as they rightly point out, it's much easier these days to keep electronic records than um, maintain volumes of filing cabinets. Yes. Hard to be sure. Uh, question number 12. How does EPA verify operator competency in environmental management and emergency management? Hi. No, I'm not too sure, actually. <laughs> Look, I would imagine they'd go back to your training records and and have a look at your program that you've used to train your staff and that type of thing. Um, if you've got good records, there's probably a fair chance that uh, they, you can demonstrate that you've trained your staff. As for competency testing specifically, I mean, I haven't seen or heard of the EPA conducting any competency testing on anyone, so... Um, for some high risk things, it might be a case of asking uh, the company to demonstrate that they've done competency assessments for high risk activities. I guess, is it also part of assessing that the EMS that they're being trained in is adequate? Well, the EPA review those very carefully. Okay. All right, well, that sort of makes sense. And number 13, what details are known about the one and only so far EPA prosecution for breach of GED? Is that the tyre person in the country? I'm not too sure, actually. Um, there is one decision that I can talk about that I'm aware of, um, and it was not a prosecution but a... Um, they were um, civil enforcement proceedings that were brought by the EPA. So there was a, a matter um, uh, concerning um, an entity called Vista Estate and the EPA um, commenced proceedings in the Supreme Court um, in relation to a breach of the GED because there was some um, works undertaken by Vista um, where... Uh, on their land at um, at Brown Hill, and they said that the, the works involved of removing vegetation and topsoil caused pollution through stormwater runoff from the land, and then that ran into um, the Yarrawi River and uh, near Ballarat. So there was a question there where the um, these enforcement, uh, sorry, the civil um, proceedings were brought by the EPA as to um, whether um, it was the onus was on the EPA to um, specify all of the matters in Section 6 um, uh, of the EP Act, which um, sets out all of those factors um, about reasonable practicability. And there was a question about whether we could call on um, 
the case law from the OHS Act, where there'd be, you know, there were clear, there was clear procedural um, and practical matters um, in relation to the interpretation of those sections and interestingly the court found that that is a different you know notwithstanding that the provisions are almost identical that um uh, we do have a slightly different regime and what um you know what the the ep act and what the ohns act do are, are quite uh, distinctive um and so there's different requirements that need to happen when you plead um the case uh, in each of those different statutory regimes. So there was a, basically there was a, um, a request by VISTA to strike out the EPA's application on the basis that they hadn't pleaded all of those factors in the Act. And um, the EPA said, well, no, no, we don't have to, to do that. And um, the Supreme Court agreed with the EPA. So that was decided, I think that happened back in um uh, September of last year from memory. So um, not um, not sure that that matter has finally been determined, but as far as I'm aware, um, that's the most um, recent guidance that we've got about um, the application of uh, a potential breach of the GED. So we'll stay tuned on the, on the outcome of the VISTA proceedings. Interesting. Question number 14, what, if any, is the role of the general community in having the GED enforced, particularly the role of citizen science to supplement EPA enforcement? Um, the community's well engaged with, um, uh, you know, engaging the EPA around pollution incidents, um, having, having, um, same same pollution incidents occur and um, talk to the EPA about them. You know, the, the community is very engaged with making sure that environmental wrongdoers are held to account. Um, so they are important in letting the, um, the, the EPA know that there's been a non-compliance somewhere. So they are absolutely key to it. Yes, often when incidents arise you know some of them will be self-reported by duty holders but in in many cases it'll be um you know where there's been a uh, a member of the community that makes a report to the epa and you know they have a a charter to investigate um when complaints are or queries are raised by members of the community if i'm on a site as a customer say, you know, I don't know, picking, picking up some goods and I notice that there's some effluent flowing off site, do I have a general environmental duty to report that? No. As an individual, you as a person do, do not. As a business or a part of an activity, whether it be um, voluntary or, or what, you do. But as just the general public, you should. <laughs> but you don't have to. Okay. Two questions to go. My microbial risks are often poorly understood and often can't be assessed using indicators. How are you dealing with that? They can be assessed using indicators. Being a microbiologist, I can say that, um, you know, if you're looking at coliforms or something from a... a digest state, which I'm guessing this question relates to, then yes, you can absolutely test for microbial activity of various types. It depends on what the risks are, but usually we're talking about fecal contamination. Um, so coliforms, E. coli, those types of things, get them tested. They great, give you a very good indication as to what's happening in that material. So um Yes, uh, the, the, the EPA actually has a microbiologist on the staff who's a subject matter expert who handles specific microbiological questions. So, yes. We actually have a portable device that's coming to the market by a company called Exact Blue that provides an on-the-spot assessment of 
fecal coliforms. So you don't have to send it to a lab. Very cool. It is very cool. Um, that's a little plug for that new technology. That's right. Question number 16. I would imagine composters might be interested in that, Richard. Uh, pig farmers and AD plants. <laughs> Thanks for that market assessment, guys. <laughs> Question number 16. Will the lack of uniformity in Australia in the state of knowledge create legal hurdles for a reasonable duty holder? I'll have a quick go at this one. If you're a reasonable duty holder, probably not. <laughs> yeah, good answer, Andrew. Um, I think that, um, yes, it's, it, it's an interesting landscape in where we have operators who operate across states and across jurisdictions. We still live in a country um, of federated states all have different um, environmental laws and requirements. So there will be differences in expectations between different regulators and different legislation. But I think, um, you know, at the moment, Victoria is still very much the, the high watermark and, um, you know, now sets probably one of the most rigorous um, preventative framework. So I think if you're, um, you know, setting your um, your compliance and your um, environmental management in line with the Victorian requirements, that will stand you in good stead. But you know, uh, sympathies to uh, our operators who are having to to navigate between jurisdictions, and and certainly, you know, I, in my experience, there are differences between state of knowledge and you know different different states have different priorities and focus and some areas will be more advanced than others um but i guess you know just highlights you know the need to be across as much as you can best practice nationally but also internationally as well all right well many thanks jackie alan and andrew thank you richard okay. So there they are. I can see Andrew now. Um, really appreciate your time for this additional session associated with the webinar. It obviously generated a lot of interest and uh, really appreciate hearing your views on that. Good to see you again. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, see you everyone. Later. everyone.